in preseason, we weren't really in those positions in the fourth quarter. You know, that was really our first rep of the fourth quarter, trying to win a game, you know, since being together. So we, we just got to learn from it. We'll be all right. Yeah, the Spurs came out on the losing end of a back and forth fourth quarter battle in Wednesday's opener. We'll see how they respond tonight. It's time for Big Board Sports. Now, nearly every game this time of year in high school football is vital to the playoff picture. Veterans Memorial and Kerrville Tyvee know that all too well right now. The two collide this evening in Kerrville for a late season 13 5 ad 2 district matchup and both the Patriots and Antlers are two and two in district action, currently fighting for better playoff seating. Last week, Veterans Memorial took a loss against Piper, making tonight's game that much more important. This game is very important. It's, it's basically a must-win game if we want to get the seed that we want to get. So it's very important, especially uh, coming off the loss last, uh, from last week. We really need a big win, help us with playoff contention, and really just help bring our team up. We all know how big this game is. We all going to come out there and give it our best. All right, that game is a part of our road trip. It's Veterans Memorial at Kerrville Tyvee, followed by Somerset and Bernie. Also, here's our game of the week. Taft versus Jay at the Gus. Kickoff is set for 7.30 tonight. Tune into the Night Beat for all of the BGC highlights. The San Antonio Spurs host division rival Houston tonight in an effort to bounce back from Wednesday's season opening loss to Dallas. Prize rookie Victor Wembanyama finished with 15 points in his debut, but struggled with foul trouble, which limited him to 23 points. Kelvin Johnson, who dropped 17 in the opener, trusts Wemby will learn to eliminate the unnecessary fouls. I want to say rookie calls, um, you know, it's just a lot of ticky tack fouls. I feel like, uh, you know, but things that he definitely will learn from, uh, you know, because we definitely need him on the court in order to, to, to be the best best team we could be uh, going forward. So, uh, you know, letting some of them go and not, not really reaching, you know, using his length and things like that. But, um, I mean, Vic's a smart player. You know, he'll make adjustments and he'll be fine. Tip-off between San Antonio and the Rockets is at 7 p.m. inside of Frost Bank Center. Houston is also looking for a bounce back win after getting blasted by Orlando 116 to 86 in their season debut. The Texas Rangers are looking to right-hander Nathan Avaldi tonight in game one of the 2023 World Series against the Arizona Diamondbacks. Avaldi on the brink of history is aiming to become the first pitcher to win five starts in the playoffs. This is Avaldi's first career start in the fall classic. And on the other side, Arizona will hand the ball to Zach Gallen, who is two and two this postseason with a 5.24 ERA. I mean, I mean the world. It's it's an amazing experience, and again, to be able to say that you're you were part of the first one, you kind of set the foundation for the years to come, and you don't really know what will happen after that. But for us to be able to say like, hey, 2023, we were World Series champions, it means a lot, and there's a lot that goes into it, and a lot of weight to it. Game one of the World Series between the two wild card teams gets underway at 7:03. This evening, Texas, of course, searching for its first ever World Series championship. The Diamondbacks looking for their second. You know, I noticed a lot of Ranger hats and even a yes. jersey in the newsroom today. It seems like a lot of people are getting in the Ranger spirit. Yes, they are. Yeah, preparing for the rain and the rain. That didn't work. Never. I was the rain and the you. Rangers. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Heck yeah. If you approve. I like it, yeah. Then it's not good. Yeah. All right, so after the break, calling for help during an emergency is as easy as dialing three numbers, 911. Here's the problem, though. That simple step, it, I mean, it sounds simple, and it is, but it's often abused. Up next, how those bogus calls don't just affect first responders. Can't believe you said that about Mary. <laughs> Nine one one, as you know, is set aside for emergencies, a way to get an ambulance, police or firefighters to respond right away. But as Katrina Weber shows us, so many people have been misusing that number that it's causing problems. Help has arrived in the San Antonio neighborhood, but it doesn't seem anyone needs it. Police and firefighters believed 911, what's your based emergency? on a 911 call that a man had been stabbed, only there's no sign here of anything wrong. A short time later, they had the same result after a call about a fire. 
These were two of several we witnessed within a couple of hours this recent morning where there was no emergency. May say there were shots fired and uh, it we go out, find out maybe it was somebody had a tire blown out. Belinda Esquivel, a communications manager for SAPD, says she has overseen plenty of calls that send officers scrambling, sometimes unnecessarily. In many cases, it may be an innocent mistake. In others, it is intentional. It might be kids or some young adults who may think it's funny to call in, but it's taking resources from the actual calls. That not only includes manpower, but time and money. SAPD figures show in the first nine months of this year, officers responded to more than 156,000 911 calls that didn't pan out. While the department says it doesn't count up the costs, even if the city spent just $1 on each of these bogus calls, that is still a lot of wasted money. Do you have a mile marker as to where you may be, like a T? As a 911 call taker, Denise Cardenas never knows what she might get. Up to 6,000 calls pour in each day. Sometimes they're life-threatening situations. Sometimes it's a loose dog in a park. Still, her job is to forward those asking for help to dispatchers who can send it to them. Each call that comes into the center has to be taken seriously. There's no way for the call takers or dispatchers to know what actually is on the other end. Every call as if what they're telling you is true in 100 percent. The hope is those calls that are not won't stand in the way of help reaching people who really need it. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. The Biden administration planning to convert commercial buildings to residential use. It's the latest effort by the government to ensure affordable housing. As part of the announcement, the Department of Transportation releasing new guidance on $35 billion available for transportation-oriented development projects. Secretary Pete Buttigieg saying this will expand residential downtowns that often rely on public transit. The administration says this new guidance will make it easier for state and local governments to repurpose existing properties. The judge in former President Donald Trump's civil fraud case says that Ivanka Trump has to take the stand. The judge says that the daughter is still intertwined with the Trump organization and knows about a specific loan in question. Now, her attorneys can appeal. They say that she shouldn't have to testify since she's no longer a defendant in that case. They also note that she hasn't lived or worked in New York since 2017. But the judge is saying that she needed to file an affidavit in order to make that argument. As the war intensifies between Israel and Hamas, the United States has repeatedly warned Iran and other actors in the region not to get involved in the conflict. But after Iranian-backed militants continued to attack American forces in the region, the United States struck back. ABC's Liz Landers is in Washington with what the Department of Defense is now saying. This morning, the United States shot down a suicide drone attempting to attack U.S. military forces at an airbase in Iraq, a move that comes just hours after another U.S. strike in the region. After at least 19 attacks on American personnel and bases, the United States struck back at facilities in eastern Syria on Thursday linked to Iranian-backed militants. The groups are believed to be behind recent rocket and drone strikes that injured American troops in Iraq and Syria. They went right at uh, targets that were tied to the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC, that is resourcing, funding, training and, and making capable all these proxy groups. A military official says the strikes were conducted by two F-16 fighter jets and there were no civilians at the target areas at the time. ABC News' Martha Raditz on the U.S. strategy. With two F-16s and hitting two munitions facilities, they went for the limited response. I think number one in their mind right now is they do not want this war to spread. They do not want to provoke the militants any further than they've already provoked because they've been trying to deter them for weeks. Earlier this week, President Biden issued a stark warning to Iran's leader. My warning to the Ayatollah was that if they continue to move against those troops, we will respond and he should be prepared. This limited U.S. strike comes as Israel and Hamas are engaged in a war that is beginning to see ground troops from the Israeli Defense Forces cross the border into Gaza for targeted raids. In Washington, Liz Landers, ABC News. Hey, coming up next, got any unused medications you need to dispose of after the break? We're going to explain why and how to properly get rid of any medicines you don't need anymore. 
Welcome back. So now is the time to check your cabinets and get rid of any prescriptions that you don't need. Tomorrow is National Prescription Drug Take Back Day, so you can anonymously drop off your medications at specific collection sites. Yeah, Mandy Gaither explains why it's so important to properly dispose of medicine you don't need and how you can find a pill drop off location near you. It's a public health crisis. The drug overdose epidemic in the U.S. led to more than 112,000 deaths being reported in a 12-month period ending in May, according to the latest estimates from the CDC. And the numbers keep rising. Narcotics, opiates obviously are an obvious problem uh, for people. And unused prescription drugs that are thrown in the trash can be retrieved, abused, or illegally sold. One reason it's critical to properly dispose of them, and that's not all. If there's stuff in your medicine cabinet, your teenage kids or other people can get into it, and or other people that are having, you know, maybe a mental health emergency and they decide to take everything in the cabinet, which I've seen a lot of as an emergency physician. Stephen Maher with Mayo Clinic says flushing pills is also common, but it can have devastating environmental effects. That can actually cause problems going through the, you know, sewage treatment plant and, and, and can actually get into the groundwater, into the soil. On Saturday, the Drug Enforcement Administration is hosting National Prescription Drug Take Back Day. People can drop off unused or expired medications with no questions asked for free and safe disposal. That includes prescription drugs, over-the-counter medications, ointments, patches, creams, inhalers and vials, pet medications, and non-aerosol medicine. Type in your zip code and address and you can find several locations where they're willing to take it back, usually at like police departments or pharmacies. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. All right, so if you want to find a place near you to drop off any unused medicine, you can visit 311.sanantonio.gov. The address is right there so that you can learn more. Busy weekend, a lot of stuff going on downtown and in other parts of the city. 78 degrees right now. What's the rain outlook, Adam? Well, we still can't rule out some pop-up downpours, I think, through about 10 p.m. I think the odds have dropped off a little bit because we're not seeing a whole lot of redevelopment and I'm seeing a lot of weakening. But an outflow boundary is moving into San Antonio. That alone could help kickstart a few little downpours. So we're not going to let our guard down through 10 o'clock as there still is that potential of some redevelopment. I want to show you the latest drought monitor. It's updated every Thursday. This does not take into account the recent rainfall since Tuesday morning, so keep that in mind. 75% of Texas considered in drought. I'll be back to show you the radar on top of this and how much rain we've seen in the drought-stricken areas in a few minutes. 60-second recap time. Tonight, the Bear County Sheriff's Office asking for your help in finding a 17-year-old accused of murder. BCSO says Isaac Gonzalez shot and killed a woman in a drive by last year. Deputies believe he is armed and dangerous. If you have any info on where he is, call 210-335-6000. Now four people are in custody after police caught them stealing copper wire from a CPS plant. San Antonio police say the group was loading about $20,000 worth of copper wire into a truck. Officers are still looking into just how they got into that property. The San Antonio police also investigating a crash that killed a 20 year old woman. It happened at I-35 near Somerset. Officers say the woman was thrown from the vehicle. She landed in a grassy median. She died at the scene. Today, the National Weather Services is confirming that an EF zero tornado touched down near East Commerce Street yesterday morning. The estimated peak winds were around 80 miles an hour. A lot of you were sent in photos and videos of that small tornado. You can check those out right now over on KSAT.com. And that is your 60 second recap. You know, Adam, as we look at some of that video, I'm still struck by the fact that we had a lot of our viewers had great footage mm -hmm. of what was a pretty quick storm yesterday. Yeah, we really did. That was a very quick moving storm. And, you know, it was I, I hate to call it always, you know, a surprise, but it was really unexpected to have a spin up like we had because we just don't have the typical atmospheric setup to really kickstart a tornado. That's why there was a lack of warning on it. And it's also the type of setup where you can uh, you can detect it 
after it forms. I mean, it just quickly forms, whereas usually you get the warnings and you've got some time and we're tracking the potential and then it may drop a tornado. This is a different situation. I want to talk about it. Go back to our drought monitor and notice the extreme and exceptional drought. Not good, but let's go back in time for some rainfall on top of it. And we had some good. Ooh, that was really fast. Well, we had some good soaking rain on top of it. That's for sure. And you look at the October rainfall at the airport over two and a half inches. Ingram nearly three inches. Vanderpool nearly four inches. City of Blanco over two inches. And this is since October 1st. Seguin four and a half inches of rain. A lot of this coming just in the past couple of days. New Berlin five inches. Adkins five point almost 5.3 inches. Impressive rainfall accumulations where we need it. But of course we need more. We're still just chipping away at it. This was a nice scene today with that downpour hitting our camera. And then the sun came out thereafter. We had just under four tenths of an inch officially at the airport just today alone. Still some clouds bubbling up off to the south. We have a few isolated showers, but don't let your guard down because we could easily see a few more quick downpours developing for the rest of this evening. So just have the umbrella handy as you're venturing out. Looking at the Weather Authority radar 12 hour rainfall estimates and pretty good coverage today, just not quite as heavy as yesterday. The green areas on the map here indicate a minimum of half an inch of rain estimated by the Doppler radar. Going forward, more rain chances, just a 20% chance tomorrow, 30% on Sunday during the day. Really, I think the weekend is going to generally be dry other than some morning dampness with fog and a few sprinkles. It's Sunday night. The real rain returns. That's with the cold front get back up to 70%. So widespread and that lasts into Monday as well. Monday is going to be a raw day, damp, rainy, windy, and cold as well. Then the rain's out of here by Tuesday morning. So trick or treating actually looking pretty good right now in terms of lack of rain. It's going to be cold. Okay. Remember trick or treating will still be cold. Speaking of the colder air, we have sixties and fifties in North Texas. Then in the core of the cold air behind this front, we're talking 20s in the Dakotas and even teens in Montana here. 73 in the morning tomorrow, 85 in the afternoon, that 20% chance. Then we get into Sunday and our temperature falls off quickly by 4 or 5 p.m. We'll be up near 80 degrees at 2 o'clock. Cold front hits at 3 o'clock and our temperature quickly drops thereafter. I think before sunset on Sunday or even around sunset, we'll be down in the 50s easily. Trick or treating. Upper 40s, wind out of the north at 10, not going to be as strong as previously expected, and dry. We are confident that's going to be dry trick or treating, no rain. Hey, check out Wednesday morning and Thursday morning. Oh, yeah. 39 in San Antonio. That'll be the coldest since February 18th. Mm. Thank you, Adam. The buzz coming up next. An Ohio artist is taking pumpkin decorating to a whole new level for the 35th anniversary of the giant celebrity pumpkin contest. Jeanette Baras decided to honor Taylor Swift with a Taylor Swift skin. Next to the nearly 400 pound pumpkin is a nod to the Kansas City Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey. Yeah, it's Kelsey. a new level. It's yeah. almost a new era, <laughs> if you would. Apata says she typically works on pumpkins that are between two and 400 pounds. It's not her first celebrity to pumpkinize. In the past, she's painted a baby Yodakin, a Trumpkin, and a Ted Lasso kin. Okay, I like that she was fixing right it's here, right there. Talented, All right. yeah. Yeah, now uh, this three year old right here might just be Central Texas's youngest business owner. Merrick Gomez started selling ice pops over the summer. It all started when his parents went to the store and like any child, he wanted a toy every time they went. So Merrick and his parents started the M&M Paletas cart. Love this. 30% of his earnings go towards savings, 25% to pay back business supplies and 35% for spending on toys. Medic also learning how to goal set. Whenever he and his family visit the store, they let him pick out a toy that he can only buy if he has enough paleta money. And that's how they learn. Yeah. I love that. He's learning how to budget already. It's very cool in more ways than one. We're rooting for you, Merrick. We'll be right back. Thank you so much for being with us during this last half last hour. We've really enjoyed your company. See you back here on the night beat at 10. See you then. Have a nice dinner.